Well, welcome to church this morning. It's great to be preaching for you on Easter Sunday. Not that I've really got much of an a Easter uh, sermon. I um, wasn't expecting to be getting the, the main slot on Easter Sunday. So we'll, we'll touch on the resurrection, though. I think it's hard to, not to preach a sermon and not talk about the resurrection of Jesus in some, some fashion. So it won't be totally devoid of, uh, of an Easter theme. So. Uh, so you're there in Acts chapter 21. What a great chapter. Have a look at verse 10. We'll start in verse 10. Acts 21 verse 10 says... And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So what we see Paul here saying, he said, look, I don't care about getting persecuted by the Jews. Look, I'm ready not only to be persecuted, but I'm ready to die for the name of Jesus. Like Paul had no fear of death at all. Like he was just always winning, always overcoming in the Christian life because he, he, he was always ready to go at any moment to be with the Lord. And that put him in a great powerful position to be always overcoming, always winning, always being victorious in the Christian life because he wasn't worried about trying to preserve his life, trying to save himself. He was ready to go at any moment. But as, as willing as, as he was to go, he was also wanting to stay. Like he wasn't on a suicide mission. Like he was wanting to continue to, to do the work, but at the same time, he wasn't, he wasn't afraid of persecution. He wasn't afraid to die. Like he wasn't trying to avoid that. Like he was like, I don't care. Send me. I'm going to Jerusalem. Even if they kill me, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And like I said, that caused him to be in a great powerful position as a man of God. Like he wasn't afraid of, of dying. So therefore he wasn't afraid of persecution. He wasn't afraid of any, any obstacles, any, any challenges, any afflictions that may come his way as a believer. And that's how we need to be. We need to be not afraid of death. We need to be willing and ready to go at any moment. And that's going to cause us to be able to be bold as believers. It's going to cause us to be able to preach the word of God without fear, without fear of what may happen. And Paul, he, he was like that, and we need to be like Paul. So Paul was ready to go, but also willing to stay. And that's the title of my sermon this, this morning is ready to go, but willing to stay. And that's how we need to be as believers. And, and Paul was a great example of that. He had a great balance in his life of being ready to go to be with the Lord at any moment, but also wanting to stay and continue the work. And we need to have a good balance in our own life. So if you think about it, if you're just on one end of the spectrum, you're just ready to go at any moment, but you're not wanting to stay, well, that, that's, that's a problem. Like, we want to be willing to, to stay, continue the work. So we don't want to be like depressed and suicidal, and like I'm sick of life, it's too hard, and I'm sick of all the, the, the disasters in the world and all, all the, the corruption in the world. Lord, take me now. We don't want to be like that. Okay, and but on the other side, we don't want to be all the way over here saying, "Look, I'm scared to die, Lord. I've loved my life too much in this world. There's too many things I want to try and accomplish, and do, Lord. I'm not ready to go." So we don't want to be in either spectrum, either end of the spectrum. If you like, we want to be ready to go, but also willing to stay and continue doing the work for as long as possible. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So let's look at the idea of being ready to go. Like, what's going to stop someone being ready to go? Well, one thing will be the fear of death, the fear of death. So we'll look at that first. So if you can turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 2, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. While you're turning there, let me look at, um, I'll read to you from Daniel chapter 3. And we see the story here of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And these three men are a great example of having that balance. So they were ready to go, but they were also willing to stay. Like they didn't want to die in the fiery furnace, but they were willing to. They wanted to stay and continue to, to serve God in Babylon. So while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 2, I'll just read to you from Daniel chapter 3. So this is a story where, where the golden image was set up by Nebuchadnezzar and it was commanded at the sound of all the music that the um, people were to bow down to this golden image. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to do that. And this, I'll read to you from verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. 
If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and, we will, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we would not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they were saying, look, we're not going to bow down. We don't need to have a special meeting. We don't need to have a conference and talk about this and try and work out what we're going to do. They said, well, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Look, we're not going to do it because we're ready to go. Look, if they weren't ready to go, look, it would have been very easy just to blend in in that large crowd and just bow down before that golden image. And they could just say, look, God, we're bowing down really to you. We're not bowing down to the golden image in our hearts, Lord. We're bowing down to you. But no, they refused to do that. They weren't going to compromise. Why? Because they're ready to go. But they're also willing to stay. So they're praying that God's going to deliver them. And they believe God is going to deliver them because they want to continue and do the work. They want to stay. And we see here that you know, keep reading the story, like God does save them in an incredible fashion, you know, from the fiery furnace. And, and that's what we need to be. Look at these, these guys here and not compromise. Like when you don't fear to go be with the Lord, when you're not afraid of dying, look, you're not going to compromise your life. Like it's very easy to compromise your life to try and continue in this world if you're not ready to go. Like it would have been very easy for these boys or young men to compromise in that situation because they didn't fear dying. Look, we're not going to compromise at all. And look, we're going to have so many opportunities to compromise in this world, aren't we? Like we want to make sure that we're ready to go, but also willing to stay. So like I said, the fear of death can be one thing that can stop us from being ready to go. Have a look there in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. A couple of great verses here. I can remember the first time I read these, these verses 25 years ago. It was just like, wow, because I really did have a fear of death as a teenager before I got saved. Let's have a look at these verses. So verse 14, Hebrews 2, 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Like one of the biggest fears that unsaved people have, and maybe some Christians as well, is the fear of death. And I know as a young teenager, I used to ponder, look, one day I'm going to die. And I was scared, but then I would console myself by saying, look, it's going to be decades away and everyone has to die. So look, you know, just don't worry about it right now. And I said, that's how I sort of kind of reconciled it with myself but look the fear of death is, is a big problem and when I read this verse for the first time after I was saved I realized well, I don't need to fear death anymore because Jesus has taken the sting away from death because Jesus says, says here that Jesus through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil so Jesus fully partook of, of death so we don't have to so we don't have to experience the sting the pain of death like Jesus died physically and then he went to hell and and suffered so we don't have to suffer that kind of death like we would never experience true death like the, the, for the believer we would never die we would never experience death the, the death that Jesus had to die but also not only are we saved from having to suffer the consequences of, of death like we also get to partake of the of the resurrection life as well which is like the Easter message, right? It's not the, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we don't just avoid the, the sting of death, but we also get to partake of the life that comes through Jesus' resurrection. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 20. It's talking about uh, the power of Jesus' resurrection. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man uh, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if you're saved, you're already made alive. And you'll never, you'll never see death if you're saved because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the great Easter message, is that Jesus rose from the dead. If we can believe that, then you'll never taste death. Like you never need to fear dying at all. As a, as a believer, you never need to fear dying. And Jesus goes to, so far as to say that when you die, you're, like, you're not even really dying, you're, you're asleep. But Jesus refers to dying as being asleep. And he makes that point because like, we don't really die. Well, physically, our body, we put off this tabernacle. We depart from this tabernacle, but we never really die. Because Jesus died for us, so we, we don't have to. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. So what we're talking about at the moment is 
is death is not something the believer needs to be worried about at all. Like no more than you'd be worried about going to sleep, you shouldn't be worried about dying as, as a believer. So Matthew 9 and verse 18 says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. So she's dead, right? The daughter is dead, okay? And he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. So Jesus said, look, no, she's not dead. She's just asleep. So Jesus actually corrects the girl's dad. Look, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. I've got some good news for you. She's not dead. She's asleep. And they're all laughing, laughing, laughing at him. So look, no, she's dead. Like she's just dead as a door now. No, 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 she's asleep. Because the believer doesn't really die. And this is what Jesus is trying to emphasize here and make the point. Like we never really die. We just like fall asleep. From, from the human perspective, from the earthly perspective, as believers, we just fall asleep. Like if you think about somebody who's asleep, so you might sleep for eight hours and you're like, you're, you're disengaged to the world, like you're just like in a different place, aren't you, when you're asleep. You're not interactive in this world, you're somewhere else, and then after eight hours you wake up again, you're back in the world again. And that's what it's like from this perspective, like when we, when we die or we fall asleep, like our body is like disengaged from this world because we're in heaven, our spirits are in heaven. But one day there's going to be a resurrection and we're going to be alive again in the world and we're going to be like awake out of sleep. So really we're just falling asleep when, when we die as believers and we should be ready to go at any time because when we die, it's better. It's better to be with the Lord than to be here. And look, I understand now it can be a little bit like uh, hard to like fully grasp that. But once you do depart and be with the Lord, you, you realise, wow, this is fantastic. I shouldn't have been so anxious about dying. You know, I should have been just, just, pers- just like seeking the persecution or preaching hard and not fearing persecution and just and not compromising and just, just keeping to my standards. And then if I had a died, going to be with the Lord, like, fantastic. It's amazing. Like, I think we need to realise that it is better to go and be with the Lord than to stay. And, and if you do have that heart, that attitude, like, you're just going to be like, a powerful believer. You're going to be unstoppable. You're going to be like a force to be reckoned with in this world because you're going to be just preaching the gospel, being bold and not compromising. And look, no one's going to be able to stop you. Only God's going to be able to stop you. One day God might say, okay, that's enough. You can go be with me now. Like We're going to look at a story soon with, with Paul. Like They even killed Paul and they tried to stop him and they killed him and, and God's like, no, 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 he's not, not ready to go yet. Raise him from the dead. Keep on going, Paul. Only God can stop you. If you don't fear death, only God can stop you. No man can stop you. You're in God's hands. And John 11, verse 25, let me, let me read it to you. It says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So look, we're never really going to die. We're always going to be alive in Christ. And whosoever liveth, and believeth in me shall never die. There you go. You will never die if you believe in Jesus. That's good news. Yeah. Believest thou this? So that's the big question of Easter, isn't it? Do you believe this? We went out soul winning yesterday and we're preaching to people about the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. And we're saying, do you believe this? And most people said, no, I'll think about it. Or no, I don't. I'm an atheist. Or no, I don't believe that. I'm, I'm a Catholic. I'm okay. I don't need to hear what you've got to say. Like Most people, they don't. They don't believe it. But that's the challenge of Easter is believest thou this? Do you personally believe in the resurrection? We need to make it personal. Like people will talk about, yeah, I, I know that Jesus rose from the dead. But yeah, do you believe it? Do you believe it personally? Did he rise from the, rise from the dead for you? Did he die for your sins personally? That's the question of Easter. And if we believe it today, we will never see death. Jesus said you'll never die. We'll just fall asleep and go, go to heaven like it's a win. Like we can't lose. As believers, you can't, you can't be defeated. You can only be defeated when you doubt, is when you're scared of, of dying, when you're trying to preserve your life. And Jesus said, let me read it to you. I've got it here somewhere in my notes. I'll read to you from Luke 17, verse 33. He says, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. So it's ironic, it's like it's the opposite. Like you're trying to save your life and, and not die and, and not get persecuted and get afflicted for the cause of Christ. You're going to lose your life. But those who just don't care, like I don't care about persecution, I'm ready to go like Paul, like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. 
and just preach the gospel and look, God's going to preserve you. God's going to do miracles to keep you alive if he wants to keep you alive. And if you're doing great works, you're willing to stay and do great exploits for the Lord, like he's going to keep you alive no matter what. No one's going to be able to stop you. Now, if we can turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, while you're turning there, let me read to you from 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Even Paul's got on board, he's saying we fall asleep, we don't die. Even those who, which are asleep, that ye sorrowed not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So Paul's saying, look, we sleep. Those who have, have died already in, in the faith, like they're asleep in Jesus, and they're going to come back. They're going to come back again. So we ought not to sorrow as others who have no hope. Look, it's the great hope of, of the believer, that we don't sorrow as others who have no hope. Look, I don't know what it would be like to lose a, a loved one as a lost person, like lose a child or a husband or a wife or, or parents and have no hope, like that's it, never going to see them again. But for us believers, like we have this incredible hope we will see them again because they're just asleep. But like Jesus said, they're asleep. I'm going to wake them up. And one day, everyone who's asleep in Christ will be woken up by Jesus when he returns. That's a great hope we have. It's amazing. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Talking about how Jesus has taken the sting of death away so we never need to fear dying. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So over the believer... There's no sting in our death and the grave has no victory over us anymore. Like, it's wonderful. What a, what a blessing to be a believer. Like, it's amazing. Look, who wouldn't want to be saved? Like, why wouldn't you want to believe this gospel and be saved and have immortality, eternal life, never die? Never have to fear death and just serve God with your whole heart all, all your life. That's amazing. Like, why wouldn't you? What a great Easter message we have from, from the Lord. Now let's look at some examples uh, of uh, people who were just ready to go, ready to go. Stephen is a great example. I'll just read to you about Stephen. If you can turn to Acts 14, if you can turn to Acts 14. I'll read to you some verses about Stephen. Now, Stephen was a man that was ready to go. He was ready to go, and he just was able to preach fearlessly. Like he preached a fearless sermon because he didn't fear anything except God. So therefore we have this great sermon recorded in Acts chapter 7. And I'll read to you from, from verse 51. So we know he preaches this amazing long sermon. And then at the end he starts to rebuke the, the Pharisees and the Jews that were listening. And verse 51 he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been their betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. So he's just rebuking these guys so powerfully and he's fearless, but no fear at all. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed him with their teeth. So at this point here, He's reached like a crossroads. If he continues down this road, like he's going to get killed. And I'm sure he knew that. He could have just backed off a little bit, just taken the foot off the accelerator, and he probably could have escaped with his life. But look, he's so full of the Holy Spirit, so fearless, that he just kept on going, kept on driving down that track in the car. Have a look. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, 
Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he what? He fell asleep. He just went to sleep. He didn't die. He just went to sleep. And because he wasn't fearful of dying, he could just preach this powerful message. And Jesus stood up from sitting at the right hand of the Father and looked on Stephen and said, that's my boy. I'm proud of him. He's full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to receive him. And what an abundant entrance he had. He would have had to heaven. Amazing. Because he didn't fear death. If he had to fear death, if he wasn't ready to go, if he wanted to preserve his life and, and not go, look, he wouldn't have had such an abundant uh, entrance into heaven. And 2,000 years later, we wouldn't be preaching about him because he was ready to go. And we need to be ready to go like Stephen and be bold like Stephen. And look, it appears that Stephen was probably the exception to the rule. Like the Apostle Paul, he had a very similar encounter where he was stoned as well and God saved him. You might remember the story in Acts chapter 14. Just, just turn there now where, where Paul is preaching in a town and he sees a cripple and he saw that the cripple had faith to be healed. So he, he commanded him to stand up on his feet and he was healed. And then the people in, in the town saw that, the, uh, the pagans and the idol worshippers, and they tried to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. And, and Paul's like, no, this is not right. And he starts to, to say, look, don't do this. We're just men like you are. You, sh- you need to turn from these vain idols. So he starts to rebuke these people who are like wanting to worship Paul and, and Barnabas. And he's rebuking them. And look, I'm sure that would have upset them, like them being rebuked and they're being told, like, your idols are vain. You need to turn from these idols. This, this, these are worthless. But then what happens is, is the Jews come along and they stir up these, these pagans. So I can imagine these Jews coming on to Paul or to the, um, to the pagans and saying things like, yeah, Paul's always going around just rebuking and, and, and you know, tearing down people's religions and stuff. You go, yeah, are you guys going to stand for this? Don't let him get away with this. And they go, yeah, yeah, we we'll just get Paul. And, and what happens is, uh, let's look at verse 18. And when these sayings scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them, and there came hither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the apostles stood around, uh, the disciples, sorry, stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed from Barnabas to Derbe. Look, this is just an incredible story. Look, they stone him. They think that he's dead. So they drag him out of the city and cast him away as, as if he's dead. Look, he probably was dead, or maybe he just had a little bit of life left him and he wasn't completely dead, but they didn't realise. I don't know, but it sort of looks like, like he was dead. And they cast him out of the city and the disciples just come around and Paul just stands up again and keeps on going. Like, just, just a day in Paul's life, like just another day in Paul's life. Just incredible. And he keeps on going. It doesn't say he needs therapy and counselling. He, he goes on holidays. Like, he just stands up and goes back into the city. Like, what a great man of God. Look, he was ready to go. And God said, look, I know you, you just died now, Paul, but look, I want you to stay. It's not time to go yet. And, and he's back alive again. Like, it's incredible. Like, we need to make sure that we're like Paul and just be bold, be ready to go at any moment. And look, only God can kill you. Like, no one else can kill you. If it's not God's time, he will save you. He can work circumstances and make sure you just avoid or, uh, any sort of punishment or whatever penalty that people may want to impose on you. But if you're seeking to save your life, like Paul could have been like, trying here, trying to weasel his way out of it. So, look, no, look, I don't, you know, you don't understand. Look, what I meant to say was this. I, I misspoke. And look, let me reparaphrase what I said. And then God might have said, yeah, maybe it's your time to go now if you're going to be like that. <laughs> But Paul's just so bold, like, like they kill him and God's like, no, this is my man, this is my, this is my man. You know, you're going to be more scriptures, more Bible to, to write, you know, you get, I'm going to save you. So we have the great example of Paul and Stephen and also Daniel, like what, Daniel, like what a great man of God Daniel was. Like he was a man that like, lived in such a hostile environment in Babylon and he's, and he's like, probably a eunuch. He's in, in like he, it would it could have been pretty tempting to be willing to go in Daniel's situation, but he was willing to stay. We know the story when, when uh, let's look at verse six, so Daniel chapter six, verse six, where the, his enemies are trying to get rid of him, so they persuade the king to, to sign this statute where no one can pray except praying to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, now jump down to verse eight. So Daniel six, verse eight says, "Now, O king, establish the decree." And sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius, 
sign the writing and the degree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he knelt down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. These, uh, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So this decree has gone out where you can't pray to anybody ex- or any God except to like Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, like, he could so easily just, like, just shut the windows and just pray inside if he was scared of dying, but he wasn't scared of dying. He had no fear of him. He was ready to go. Look, I'm not going to compromise my standards just, just because of some stupid degree. If God wants me to go, look, I'm ready to go, but I'm going to go to my window. I'm going to just pray three times a day and let the chips fall where they may, and God will pick up the pieces. Like, God will do what's right. I'm not, I'm not going to compromise. And, like, we need to be like Daniel. At least this day and age, so easy to compromise so easy just to lower our standards a little bit to try and preserve your life or preserve some sort of quality of your life that you may lose. Look, no, I'm, I'm going to stick to my standards, stick to the word of God, and look, God's going to pick up the pieces. If I go to heaven, praise God, that's the best outcome I could hope for. If I get to stay and continue to preach the gospel, praise God, more win. I'm going to be winning more and more and more. Like, you can't lose. If you're ready to go but willing to stay, you can't lose in the Christian life. You're going to all be, always be winning. And we know that, that God did a miracle, sent his angel, shut the mouth of the lions, and Daniel was saved. Daniel was saved. Like he wasn't seeking to save his life. He was willing to lose it, but then he preserved it. God saved him and preserved it. Now, so we can see here that the fear of death is one reason which can stop us from being willing to go. And look, there's no, no sting in our death, so we ought not to fear death. And another thing which can stop us from being willing to, to go and be with the Lord is being too affectionate with this world. It's being too caught up in the affairs of this life. And that when the time comes, we can be like, no, I don't want to go because you know, I've just bought this boat. I've just bought this field. I'm just trying to, 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 to buy this, this you know, mansion or whatever. I've got too much invested in this life. I'm not ready to leave it. I can't go yet, Lord. But this is, that's one thing which can also stop us. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, if you can turn there. See, if Daniel, if he had set his affections on the things of Babylon, look, do you think he would have taken that stand that he did? No, he probably wouldn't have done. He probably thought, probably look, I love my position. I love the influence I have. I'm in, I'm in such a, a, a cruisy position here in, in Babylon. Look, I just think I'll just shut the blinds and just pray. Well, that's what he could have done if he, if he had his affections set on Babylon, but he had his affections set on things above. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, If ye then be risen with Christ which we are, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. So we need to set our heart, our affections, our mind on the things which are above, not on the things of this earth. And that's a big challenge as believers because we live in this world, we're surrounded by all these things which are trying to get our affection, trying to get our, our interest and trying to get us to, to buy these things and buy into these things and invest into these things. But we need to, first and foremost, keep our affections on the Lord, on the things above. It's not wrong to have houses and cars and boats and things as long as they don't take after your heart, they don't take hold of your heart and take hold of your affections. Because then when the time comes to... To, to stand, make a stand for the Lord, you'd be thinking, oh, well, I think I'm just going to tone the preaching down a little bit because I, I love this world too much. I'm just going to close the blinds so people can't see that I'm a Christian. I'm just going to just you know, be quiet in the workplace. I'm not going to share my faith because I love this life. I love what I have. I want my affections in this world. I don't want to lose these things. But if you've got your affections on things above, well, you're not going to care about losing things down here because your affections on, on things which are above. And one man in the Bible that set his affections on the things of this world that wasn't ready to go was Hezekiah. So if you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. While you're turning there, let me read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him, who have chosen him to be a soldier. Like we're soldiers in the Lord's army, aren't we? And we don't want to be entangled with the affairs of this life because we're not going to be effective to serve the Lord. 
is what Paul's saying to Timothy here. We don't want to entangle ourselves. We can be in this world and live in this world, which is what we should be doing, but we don't want to become bound up and entangled and just all caught up in the affairs of this world so we can't just at any moment be ready to go and be with the Lord. So let's look at Hezekiah. Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, says there, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set mine house in order, for thou shalt not live, should, for, sorry, for thou shalt die and not live. So this should have been good news for Hezekiah. Oh, God's given me some forewarning. I'm about to go to heaven, receive my reward. Thank you, Isaiah. Fantastic. This is great news. But it wasn't so. It wasn't so for Hezekiah. Let's have a look at what he did. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart and done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. So he's not ready to go at all. He's rolled over and looking at the wall. He's bawling his eyes out, saying, Look, I don't want to go, Lord. Don't take me now. So I'm like, here's my question is uh, to you and to me. Like, if, if you knew you were going to go and be with the Lord like today, like, what would your attitude be? How would you feel about that? How would, you, how would I feel about that if, if somehow God said, look, today is your day. Set your affairs in order, Jason. Today's the day. Like, how, how would you feel? Like, would you be like, yes, I can't wait. It's going to be so exciting. I'm so glad I lived a, a fruitful life serving the Lord. It's time to go. Or would, you, or would you be like Hezekiah? Would you weep sore? Would you roll over, look at the wall and cry your eyes out? And No, oh, Lord, give me, give me longer. Like, how would you be, you know? Something, don't, don't, don't answer, <laughs> don't answer, but, but think about it, like how, how would you be, how would you feel? And Hezekiah, like he wasn't ready to go. He's, he, was, he was willing to stay, but he wasn't ready to go. So how would we be, you know? Hopefully we'd be ready to go, we'd be rejoicing, we'd say, giddy up Lord, I'm ready, I'll just say my goodbyes and I'll see you guys soon when I wake up and then we'll go because we're about to fall asleep, right, not, not die. So how would, how would you feel? And let's keep reading. In verse 4. And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Love saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. So here we can see God's mercy. Like God's merciful to Hezekiah. He said, look, okay then, I see you. You're crying like a baby. You're, like, you're not ready to go. I get it. Okay, I'll give you 15 more years, you big cry baby. And that's what God said. Like, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. Like, God's merciful. God is kind and gracious, isn't he? So he does answer our prayers. And he, he can change his mind. Like, you may be on your deathbed, but God can save you and God can raise you up like he did to Hezekiah. But I don't know if you know the story of Hezekiah, but he, he did mess up a little bit. Like he allowed messengers from Babylon to come in. And very foolishly, he just showed them everything in the kingdom, all the treasure in the, in the, in the temple and, and showed them everything. And Isaiah said, like, what have you done? He said, oh, look, I showed them things. I showed them everything. It's like, okay, well, everything is going to be taken away. You know, this, this is bad, but it's not going to happen in your day. And then Hezekiah is like, oh, good. Well, at least I'm not going to see it. That's just good news. So he wasn't a quality person in some regards. So it would have been better if he just had a rejoiced in, in the prophet's word that he was going to go and be with the Lord and just went then rather than stay for another 15 years and, and make some mistakes. So when it's your time to go, just embrace it and go and fall asleep and you get to go to heaven, be with the Lord. And before you know it, look, I don't know what time is like in heaven, but like down here it can be many, many years and can seem like a long time, but I, I don't know what, what you guys may think, but in heaven maybe time's different. Maybe you, you die, I mean, fall asleep, go to heaven. And before you know it, we're all together again. Look, I don't know how it works, but, but it's definitely um, something that we shouldn't be fearing, trying to avoid like Hezekiah. We're not looking for it, we're not wanting to, to die, but we're willing to stay. But when the time comes, look, we're ready. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to lower our standards. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. And we need to have that, uh, that confidence that we're in this day and age more than ever. How we can see how the world is just compromising, becoming more hostile to the word of God than ever before. And we need believers, we need churches, we need preachers, soul winners who aren't afraid to die and are going to kiss, keep preaching the word of God without compromise and just preach it black and white and not try and water it down.
and God will preserve your life. Like God doesn't want you to go to heaven before it's your time because he needs people like us here preaching the gospel. And most of us, I'm sure, are going to be here for decades, for years to come, preaching the word of God. So let's look at now how we, we ought to be willing to stay. We need to be willing to stay. So we want to have that balance. We're not, we're not over here just say, God, I'm just going to preach so hard to see if someone's going to kill me. We don't want to be like that. We want to be also over here saying, Lord, I'm willing to stay for as long as you need and to keep preaching the gospel. And, and Jesus was the ultimate example of this, wasn't he? He was the ultimate example of being willing to stay because he wanted to go be with the Father and avoid dying on the cross. Like he said, Lord, if it's possible... Lord, let this cup pass for me. But if not, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. That's what he said. Like, maybe not exactly how, that, how it's written, but he was willing to stay and do the Father's will, even if that meant going and dying on the cross. And as believers, we need to be willing to stay and do the work, even when it's hard. The Bible says, endure hardship. As believers, we need to do hard work, endure these hard things. And Jesus was like, yep, I'm willing to stay, Lord, and do the work. And Jesus, like he would have us to stay. He would us have us been willing to stay and do the work. So if you can have a look at Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 36. While well, you're turning there, I'll just read to you from Mark 14. And I'll just read to you verse 35 says, And he went forward a little and fell on the ground, and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou will. So he was saying, look, my will is to, to go be with you. That's what I would like to do. But not what I will, but what you will, Lord. And that's what our attitude needs to be. Look, our will might be, look, I want to be in heaven right now because things down here aren't the best right now for me. And we're all going to go through times like that, even the greatest men of God are on the earth. They went through times like where, God, where they were like, God, take me now. But we need to do his will um, above our own will. And that's what Jesus did. Amen. And Luke 21 verse 36 here, this is Jesus talking. It says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things which shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So he's talking about the end times, all these crazy things which are going to happen in the end times. So Jesus is saying, look, you ought to be praying that you can escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man when he returns. So he, we should have the attitude, Lord, I want to remain until the end. I want to be there when you return, Lord. I don't want to die um, in, the, in the great tribulation, when all these things are happening, Lord, I want to remain to the end. If I do die, well, praise God, I'm ready to go. I'm going to receive rewards for that. But Jesus is saying, look, pray that you can remain until the end. So Jesus wants us to be willing to stay, okay? And, look, and we need to be willing to stay. We need to spend time in... We only have a small window on planet Earth to do works, to get, get your war stories, if you like, because we're going to be in heaven for a long, long time talking to the saints. Imagine talking to like Elijah, Moses, Paul, Peter, Job, and, and they're just telling you their stories. And they say, well, what about your stories? <laughs> oh, well, well I, was, I was talking on my phone. I wasn't watching where I was driving and I crashed my car and died. Like, oh, okay. All right, anyone else got any stories? So you want to have some good war stories. You want to be talking about preaching the gospel, doing great works, great exploits. So when... When Paul comes up to you and says, Caleb, what did you do for the Lord? Well, how much time you got, Paul? I lived to be an old man. I lived to be in my 90s. And I did much soul winning. saw many people get sold, saved, raised up some great soul winners and whatever. And I did great works for the Lord. And one day, Lord, I, yeah, you, the Lord returned and I went to be with him. I'm like, wow, that's a great story, Caleb. Hey, what church did you go to? New Life Baptist Church? Well, I need to find some more people from that church. They've got some good stories. As we want to have stories to tell, so that's why we need to go on these soul-winning marathons. We need to do the works. We need to take the stand. We need to not compromise because you're going to be in heaven for a long time telling stories. You don't want to be saying, look, I tried to preserve my life. I hid out in, in the mountains. Like, oh, really? Okay, well, it's good that you were saved, brother. Well, it's good that you're here. Because, <laughs> you know, we want, to, we want to do the works. So we need to be willing to stay and do the works. And that's not... And let's not be um, uh, afraid to, to stay and do the works and get some great stories. So what are some things we can stop you 
from wanting to, to stay. Of wanting to stay. Well, being depressed, being discouraged, look, we all are going to have times where we start to feel depressed, down in the dumps, overwhelmed by life, and when we, we can have that attitude, Lord, just take me now, I don't want to stay anymore. And look, it's normal to feel like that from time to time. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 19. One Kings chapter nineteen. We see the famous story here of, of Elijah, how he had just won that great victory on Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven and, and destroyed all those false prophets. And then what happens is in verse one of one Kings nineteen, verse one, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also. If I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Bathsheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. And he, went, uh, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Like he's hit the, the, the bottom here, like he's hit rock bottom here, and he's saying, God, I want to die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So he's depressed, he's, hit, he's gone from the top, the mountain top, of seeing fire come down from heaven. Now he's hit the rock bottom, and he's depressed, and he's praying, God, I want to die, I'm no better than my father's, look, take me now. And the thing is, look, we all are going to have times like this. Like Elijah, the great man of God, he went through this himself. And look, we're no different to Elijah. We're going to feel like that. But the thing is, it's, it's okay to feel like that. It's okay to feel like depressed at times, down in the dumps, and wanting to go and be with the Lord. But the thing is, what you need to do is tell God that. Is bring that to God in prayer. That's what Elijah did. Like He wasn't like, oh, I'm a bit too ashamed to go tell God how I feel. Like we don't want to be like that. Look, if I can say anything to you that you will take away from this sermon, it's this. Just be honest to God in prayer. Just go to God and tell him how you feel. That's what David did throughout the whole Psalms. And this is what Elijah is doing. He is going to God and say, God, look, take me now. Kill me now, God. Take me now. Look, I'm no better than my father's. I'm depressed. I've had enough. It's too hard. And he goes to God. And we, we need to go to God when we feel like that and tell God that. And what happens? And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, this is verse 5, Behold, and then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So maybe he's thinking, well, God just doesn't want me to die on an empty stomach. So okay, well, I'll eat this food and then I'll go back to sleep. And, okay, now kill, now kill me, God. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Now, like the journey of life like, is too great for us. Like sometimes you can feel like that. The journey of life is too great. And sometimes you're going to feel like that. And like it is. Like it's impossible to do those things that God's called us to do without God's help. So God realizes that like, the journey, it, it is too great for you, uh, Elijah. And what happens? And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. So he's prayed to God. He's, he's been honest to God about how he feels. Look, I'm depressed. God, I just want to die right now. And he gives him some food. And the food that he gets from God is enough to make him run 40 days and 40 nights. That's some good food for like a, a marathon or whatever. But God gave him this food. And the thing is that he, he sought the Lord and the Lord gave him the food that he needed. Look, and the food that we need is, is in the Word of God. But the food that God gives us to help us to keep going is in the Word of God. But we need to go to God when we're depressed and down the dumps and say, God, this is how I feel. And just all warts and all, just tell God exactly, don't hold back. Just give it all before God and then go, right, now you've been honest with me, now you've come to me, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the Word of God and it's going to give you the strength for the journey to keep on going. And even Moses, turn to Numbers chapter 11, even Moses 
was depressed as well. Like this, this has happened to, to, to great men of God. Like you think of Elijah and Moses, they'll probably be in your top five greatest men in the Bible. And they both struggled with depression and being down in the dumps and being overwhelmed by life. And God helped them and, and they were able to turn to God. And have a look in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 11. Numbers 11 verse 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant, and wherefore have I not found favour in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them, that they should say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give me flesh, or give us flesh, that we may eat. Am I not able to bear... I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. So we see here like Moses is going to God and he's putting his burden upon God. And he's not holding him back, is he? Like he's pretty bold in his complaint to God. And we need to be like that. Like God can handle it when you're honest and bold to him about how you feel. Like do it. Pray to God. <clears throat> and when you're feeling overwhelmed. And if thou deal lust with me, Kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favour in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. So he's like, God, kill me now if you favour me. Like, if you favour me, God, kill me now. I want to go. I don't want to see my wretchedness. I'm over this. This is driving me nuts, these people. I can't, I can't handle it anymore. Kill me now, God. See, look, it, sometimes we're going to feel like that in life. And that's going to cause you wanting to depart. You're willing to go, aren't you? But you're not willing to stay and we don't want to be like that. But when we are like that, let's learn from Elijah and Moses and be honest about how you feel. Don't hide that from God, but go to God and pour it all out to God. Like Elijah didn't hold back, Moses didn't hold back and God can handle it, okay? And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. So then God's merciful steps in and helps him, solves his problem, and provides another 70 people which can share the burden. So God cares. Like God cares about you. When you're feeling like that, God does care and he's going to help you. But we need to go to God first and not hide. Don't be ashamed to go to God when you do feel like that. Because we're all going to go through times like that. But often, like was like, I can't, I, it's wrong for me to feel like that. I can't tell God how I feel. I'll just push it all down and pretend everything's okay. No, don't be like that. Just go to God and tell God, God, this is how I feel. I'm so depressed. I'm so down in the dumps. Life's too hard. And go to God and he'll help you and he'll give you joy and give you peace and give you the word of God and he can snap you out of that. Okay. <clears throat> now I want to finish looking at Philippians chapter 1. We started by looking at Paul and it's finished by looking at Paul as well. So Philippians chapter 1. And we do see Paul have a great balance between the two. A great balance between willing to, to depart and be with the Lord and also willing to stay. And Paul is such a great example for us. Have a look there, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but, with that, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Like, wasn't Paul fantastic? This body I'm in right now, I'm going to use it to serve God no matter what happens. If I'm alive... Fantastic, I'm going to use it to serve God, glorify God. If I'm going to die, fantastic, I'm going to use it to glorify God. Like he was going to glorify God no matter what, if he's alive, if he's dead. Look, it's no, it's no brainer for Paul. He's going to glorify God while he's in this body. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Like if you have that attitude, you cannot lose. If I live, that's, that's good. I'm going to live under Christ. If I die, well, that's better. Can, cannot lose what, what harm who can harm you with the attitude like that is fantastic if you can if i can be like that if you can be like that look you, you're an unstoppable force for the kingdom of god that's what paul was so powerful because he had that attitude and god could use a man like that he can use a woman like that even children you know if we can be like that we are confident 
let me read to you. I'll just take one step away from Philippians chapter 1. But stay there in Philippians chapter 1. I'll just read to you 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. says, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So Paul's saying, look, I'm more willing to be gone, but I'm willing to stay as well. I want to depart and be with the Lord, which is far better, look, but I'm willing to stay. We are confident, I've read that, but 22 Philippians 1 verse 22 now, but if I live on in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labour. So he's willing to stay so he can do work, he can labour unto the Lord. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I, I am in a strait betwixt the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better. No, it's far better. It's far better, not just better, it's far better. So Paul, like, look, I don't care if I get killed, it's far better. And we need to realise it's far better to fall asleep and go be with the Lord than to stay. It's far better. So don't be afraid of dying. Take, listen to Paul. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul's saying, look, it's far better that I go, but it's better for you that I stay. So Paul's saying, look, I'm willing to stay because I can be a blessing to the people of God. So that's, that shows us that if we're going to be staying, let's not stay here to, to live our own lives, to build our own kingdoms, to seek our own interests in this world. But let's stay to be a blessing to God's people. Let's stay like Paul did, to bear fruit unto the kingdom of God and to minister to one another. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your fervence and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. But we can see, Paul, what a great example. What a great example. He was ready to go. I don't care about the, the Jews trying to persecute me. I'm ready for persecution, but I'm also I'm ready to, to die, not just be persecuted. But then he says, look, but I'm willing to stay and be a blessing and encourage you all and help you to keep, continue on to serve God. All right, let's close there. Let's close in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we just 